Hello, sportsmen. Hey, you know, one of the most fun trips that I've had in, in, in many years, really, was fishing up in Rawhide Lake. I mean, this was a trip that was a, really a do-it-yourselfer. We had to pack ourselves back in. We had to use a lot of inventions and gadgets uh, to figure out how to catch those lake trout. But we did. It was a lot of fun. And if you stick around for a few minutes, I'll show you how we did it. I'm Fred Trost. You're watching The Practical Sportsman. I think we got dinner. Fred Trost Practical Sportsman is brought to you by Enviro Industries of Paradise, Michigan, makers of wood fire barbecue briquettes made from 100% natural hardwoods that burn completely. Wood fire briquettes give food the flavor of an old fashioned wood fire barbecue. By D.L. Kessler and Sons Construction, specializing in residential development and commercial construction since 1977. And by the financial support of viewers like you. But he's our first one. Yeah. Nice. We've taken two trips to Rawhide Lake up in the Elliott Lake region of Ontario. Our goal was to catch lake trout on light tackle, and we had a ball. Now, Rawhide isn't that far from the Sioux, but it is a remote lake because motor vehicles aren't allowed to drive to the lake itself. That means it's quiet peaceful, serene, and during the summer, there are rarely more than 25 people on this lake at any one time. Now, some fishing parties fly in. It's easy, and it's fun to fly to a remote lake, but it costs an extra 100 bucks or more compared to the alternative, which is carrying in your gear yourself. Scott Seaman, the general manager of WNMU-TV in Marquette, introduced us to Rawhide Lake on a budget. We carried in our food, clothing, fishing tackle, and motors over the portages, piece by piece. I couldn't help wondering if there wasn't an easier way, especially for the heavy stuff. So when we made a return trip the following summer, we brought a deer dolly. This was a new product on the market, which we were trying, originally designed to haul deer out of the woods. I figured we could use it to haul our equipment in and out of Rawhide Lake. And we tried different ways of loading our gear on this and pushing the dolly, then pulling it. We found that on rocky or uneven terrain, it was best with two people, one on each end. Lift and carry it over bumps and logs, roll it on the flat ground. Also, it was very important to have a low center of gravity with ice chests and outboard motors on the bottom. 169 bucks seems a little steep for just a deer dolly, but we found ways to expand its usefulness. On the same trip, we also tried a homemade rolling cart, this one with a single wheel on the bottom. Jim Fountain brought this cart, which he and his brothers designed, built, and used for hauling their equipment and supplies in and out of deer camp. Now, there was a wheel well in the middle of the cargo compartment, handles on each end at waist height for two guys to steer it or carry it. The odd shape of the cargo area was really best suited for packing with things that uh, well, weren't in large boxes. It was really suited for lots of small things if you wanted to pack it full. Besides the cargo compartment, you could also pile gear on the top. We put our duffel bags here, tying them down with bungee cords, which, by the way, are extremely useful on any hunting, fishing, or camping trip. Bungee cords are a fast and easy replacement for rope. But they ought to be a part of every practical sportsman's gear bag. Now, the one thing we had to get used to with this homemade carrier was the relatively small amount of clearance on the bottom. When we came across obstructions of any type, we found it was easier to lift the whole unit up and carry it over the uneven ground. Otherwise, the bottom of the cart always seemed to bump on something. With a fully loaded cart, remember, it's heavy, so it takes a couple of hefty guys to move it, but it's a heck of a lot easier than shuttling this stuff back and forth one trip at a time. Carrying an outboard motor any distance at all is really awkward and takes a toll on your arms, but rolling it, hey, that's easy. On flat ground, it's cake. So a practical sportsman has a choice. Flying in, which is convenient and quick, or carrying your gear, which doesn't cost anything. And there are a few products on the market, like the Deer Dolly, which you can also use for rolling gear, not just deer, or you can make a cart to do the same job if you're handy and want to make a project out of it. The end result was that we got the Rawhide Lake and we took more gear using the dollies than we would have if we had to carry everything separately. 
That's how we trekked back into this remote lake. It really wasn't so difficult. But since that trip, a lot of people have sent in plans and ideas for projects like this, different ways of carrying gear. Now, here's a deluxe carrier that Brian Lipp from Half Moon Bay, British Columbia designed. His wife, Kath, sent us the pictures. It's a combination backpack, wheelbarrow, and stretcher. That's a top-of-the-line homemade invention. Now, here's one that uses discarded lawnmower handles. Practical Sportsman member Kevin Rowlett from Lakeland made this from two lawnmower handles, wheels, and a piece of closet shelving. Matt Radzilowski will be making one like that this fall on the show. In fact, we're going to have the plans for a lot of these handy gadgets and inventions in a publication coming out in December, which we call the Digest of Plans, Inventions, and Practical Products. That's what this TV show is all about. Now we're going to get back to Rawhide Lake and give you some practical tips on catching trout. When the owner of Frontier Lodge told me that only the old pros could catch lake trout from Rawhide Lake in the summer, I wasn't disappointed. I took that as a challenge. The waters of Rawhide Lake are cold and clear. The rocky shorelines drop off steeply into 100 or 200 feet of water. The old pros use lead core line and fish trout the old-fashioned way. Now, I didn't plan on fishing the old-fashioned way, first of all, I brought portable Big John downriggers made in Traverse City designed to clamp onto small boats. The gunnels of the big steel boats at Rawhide needed to be shimmed with a block of firewood so the downrigger clamps would hold. Now these downriggers replace heavy sinkers and lead core line. My second modern tactic was portable flashers and graphs to electronically tell us the water depth and help locate fish. Rechargeable 12-volt batteries run these portable units. We found that 20 hours on one charge was stretching it, but we could use a graph all day on one charge. The transducer on a portable depth finder sticks to the stern with a suction cup. Now we tied a line to the bracket just in case the suction cup pulls loose, which happens now and then. Now, we had to carry all of our gear over two portages in the Rawhide Lake. That includes outboard motors and gas, so small motors are the most practical. And there's nothing like the reliability of one pull on an old six-horse Evinrude. Rude. Small motors also idle down real slow, excellent for trolling. Head out to the rock pile over there? Yep. You notice my pant legs are tucked into the tops of my socks? That's called mosquito and black fly protection. One black fly up your pant leg can make you itch like crazy. This is the rock slide. The drop off you see up the hill continues sloping under the water to more than 500 feet in this spot. Now we located trout down 40 feet along the edge of the drop off. The key to catching these fish is getting your lure down exactly 40 feet where those fish are. That's what the downriggers are for. John Ford is using a lightweight spinning rod. He clips the eight pound test line to the downrigger release. The three pound weight is lowered down 40 feet. When the fish hits, it pulls the line off the clip. Then John can fight the fish free of the weight that took the lure down. Now this was our first day of fishing and success came rather easy. Another fish about the same size. Real funky though. This one's got a lot more fight than the other one does. Oh, he's barely hooked now too. Maybe you swing him aboard or what? Yeah, I better swing him aboard here. Oh, there he goes. Well, <laughs> <laughs> What'd you say about him being lightly hooked? He was very lightly hooked, and we missed him. Oh, sure, we could use a net, but when the fish are hitting, you take chances. The best bait was minnows hooked on rigs similar to the night crawler harnesses we use in Michigan for walleye. Small treble hooks are preferred at rawhide. These trout twist and flip when they fight. Treble hooks seem to be a big advantage. Notice the kinks in the wire of the harness? That rig had caught quite a few trout. <laughs> oh, see how those lake trout fight? This one had been hauled up from oh, 40 or 60 feet, but on light tackle, they fight like crazy, a lot better than they would when they're caught on lead core line with weights. 
You can tell we're having good success when we swing fish aboard because if we lose them, we know we'll catch more. During the battle, the hooks often come loose and rehook themselves. That's the advantage of two small treble hooks and a lot of barbs there. We kept our trout in a live basket. The next stop, of course, was the frying pan. The minnows we used all came from Rawhide Lake from minnow traps we checked every day. Now this is the rig with what's called a stinger hook on the end. You don't need a stinger hook, but a lot of people up here are feeling lately that the fish are, it's called striking short. They appear to be grabbing the minnows at the back end of the minnow. So we put a hook back there as well as up front. Now, what we use to attract this, there's, these are just hooked together with snap swivels. And this is a, uh, a rig, a, a junior size cowbell rig. These are what's called willow leaf blades. They're silver on both sides. In fact, they come on and off. This is what I like about this clevis arrangement here. You can, you can take the blades on and off and replace them. And since silver seemed to be the hot color, I put these on. Now, willow leaf blades are big blades. They really thump in the water. In fact, I'll show you right here how this looks. Put it in the water and pull it. Oh, that looks good on a cloudy day. Look at that. So we'll hook it to the downrigger and keep going through this area. We've caught these in oh, 80, 90 feet of water, but they've only been 50 or 60 feet down. And we can mark them on the graph. Uh, they're suspended. They haven't been suspended the past few days, but they're suspended now and we're able to, to catch them. So that's the key, these little downriggers, uh, just some basic flashers with some minnows. And it works. Well, we knew we could count on our tackle but we could never count on Mother Nature. She threw us a curve early in the week with a cold front. This. this is a better one. It's raining a little bit. This is about the same spot where Doug got that big one. This is, a, this is much better, substantially better. It's funny, I saw the, I saw the downrigger move. I didn't see the rod, rod move, and then I saw the rod after that. But they don't hit hard initially. But this one, I think you'll agree, is better. I'm running now. Tim, Tim Ferrigan said uh, he caught a couple trout on silver, so I switched to that silver attractor, which is like a Williams Wobbler's, a GW spoon. And then I wanted to try uh, Don Morgan's uh, cowbells, which were really designed for walleye. And with the clevis, I put on big silver willow leaf blades. So I'm kind of excited that they've worked too. I don't know if it, does, it doesn't look the that The cold good. front stifled everyone's fishing success for a couple days. That didn't stop us from fishing or enjoying the trip, but when the weather straightened out, it was a welcome change because our fishing success straightened out too. There we go. Yeah, it's a good size one. Well, good size for the frying pan, that is. You know, I, I, gotta, I gotta make a confession here. We've gone a couple days here and success has been marginal. I mean, <laughs> Doug caught that huge laker, but it's really been rugged. And now, in the matter of about two hours, we've caught several. So we're pleased. In fact, we have, I think, one more to go for our limit, Johnny. That's right. That's uh, five we've got in here so far. Good deal. Okay, he's hooked. Well, you can see how these stinger hooks. See, I thought it was foul hooked initially. The front hook he has in the mouth and this rear hook that got wrapped around there. Now this is a this is a rig that they use up here traditionally is a large single hook with the minnow in it and then the stinger hook which really doesn't extend too much past that that big hook but that's a nice trout. That is a dandy. So we got one more to go for the limit and the rain stopped and we're in the spot where the big one is we're getting bigger. Okay, I mentioned the big one, the big lake trout that Doug Tabor caught using a rig like we were using. He located trout on the eagle graph. Here you can see fish in 154 feet of water. The bottom is very uneven. Using light tackle on a downrigger, the day the sun came out, Doug put a huge lake trout on the stringer. I mean, check out the reaction back at camp. Look at the size of that <laughs> Oh, that's one awesome. was all we got, though. Jeez, oh, please. <laughs> Where'd you get it? <laughs> well, the Fountain family from Lansing couldn't believe their eyes. In a few weeks, we'll show you that fish. Close to 50 pounds. It was a trout you only see in your wildest dreams.
A lot of times those really big fish need a special recipe, and we have one on page 11 of the Practical Sportsman Cookbook. It's called Poached Fish. It isn't really a, a recipe recipe. It's a way of cooking fish that makes stronger tasting fillets taste mild. Now you can use anything. Big trout, salmon, big walleye work well. Cover the boneless fish with water in a pan. Season with salt and pepper and a few lemon slices. Bring this to a boil, then reduce the heat. Simmer for, oh, say, 10 minutes per inch. The oils and strong flavor will boil out of the fish, and what you have left will taste mild. Now, if you want to jazz it up, add some white wine to the poaching water. For a spiced flavor like pickled fish, add onions, cloves, a bay leaf, and thyme. For really strong fish, poach them in milk. Well, you can eat poached fish with butter or sauces, use it in salads, casseroles, on sandwiches. Poached fish. Give it a try. It's great. That's Guess good. who's back with the practical sportsman, Charlie Keenan. You saw him a couple weeks ago walleye fishing with John Ford on the St. Clair River. One of Charlie's main jobs is being the answer man for all those questions that viewers send to us. For example, George Hall has a disability and he qualified for a crossbow permit. He said, I've looked at a couple and all the ones I've tried are too heavy. I'm only five feet tall and 95 pounds. Do you know anybody who could help me find a good but lightweight crossbow? Oh, yes I do, George. Charlie, our answer man. I don't know the answer to what the lightest crossbow is. There are probably hundreds of them out there in the market. But what I can do is call up Jim Shuri at Anderson Archery, exchange the numbers between the two people, and I know now that he's got his answer by talking to Jim. Good work, Charlie. Now we got a phone call the other day from Robert Andrews. He apparently was watching Mark Raymond demonstrating the training of pointers. He saw Mark using live homing pigeons for training, and he wondered if we knew any place he could find homing pigeons. Well, we'll be publishing the information like this in the Practical Source Book in Sportsman's Yellow Pages. The first edition will be coming out in July, and okay. Charlie's getting the information together right now. There are a lot of game breeders out there. Um, a lot of them breed different, different animals, so it is difficult to find, you know, who has pigeons. The best thing to do is to call a person that you know is a dog trainer. I called Charlie Lindblade, and he gave me the name of uh, the Cross family. Uh, down in Ida, Michigan, and uh, they raise Hungarian partridge, pheasants, pigeons, the whole works, and that's the number that I uh, passed on. Well, those were just two of many, many questions and answers that Charlie Keenan has been handling recently. Uh, we're going back into our files. I mean, we have letters even longer than a year ago that he's answering, and he'll be getting answers out to you people very soon. Now, what do you suppose the most common types of questions we get are about? There isn't any common question uh, that we get. It. They're, they're all over the place. Um, one of the things that uh, uh, people are concerned with, I think most of all, is uh, problems with the DNR. Well, those types of questions will be investigated by Charlie. Charlie, since he's getting the answers to things, our answer man on staff, he's going to be getting the facts of questions like that. Since I'm in law school, I'll be digging out the answers to these questions of law. Together, we'll be putting out a publication in September called Questions of Law for the Practical Sportsman. I think that's going to answer a lot of questions that sportsmen have. And I know already with the publication we just came out with, our trophy book, that we're answering questions about where those big ones are. <laughs> This fish was caught off Alcona County, looks like sort of like a salmon, sort of like a steelhead, but it isn't. It's an unusual fish, a highly prized fish, oh, in, in Europe, in England, in Scotland. Uh, it's an Atlantic salmon. Eric Clive from Redford caught it off Alcona County on the 4th of July. Yep. What's it like to catch an Atlantic? Like, what, what? like lake trout? No, no, no tell no me it's not true. All. No. Honestly, I, the Atlantic salmon is supposed to be the premier primo tail walking, nope. exciting. Come up, hooked it, come up on top of the water, and it was just doing one of these numbers on top of the just water. flopping on the water? Got, I said, that's a big lake trout, because we were fishing a nine-day tournament up there. We thought it was a brown, and uh, took it up there, bait shop. They thought it was a brown. The DNR officer was there, and he says, no, that was an Atlantic. Luck. Too bad it wasn't a category for it. Just salmon trout. And 
Oh, you mean in the tournament? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's unusual. That you caught a very unusual fish that uh, I don't think it knew it was an Atlantic salmon. Didn't Probably not. Like one, huh? Well, congratulations on that. Thanks, Yeah, I hope to see more of those. Eric Clive from Redford. We only had two Atlantic salmon entries in our 1994 awards. They're listed on page 64 of the trophy book. They were caught on June 23rd and July 4th in Northern Lake Huron. Now, lake trout are a different story. We have two pages of award winners grouped by county. Flip the page, you'll see the map, which shows which counties produced the trophy lakers. Now, the two graphs show the most prevalent times. Between 10 and noon was the best. Uh, the other graph shows the, the months of the year. The peak months are July and August. This is the kind of data we have in the trophy book, along with other charts that tell the most popular baits, lures, and methods. And it's at our awards banquet, where you learn how big the fishermen are. Well, over the years, it seems like the fish have gotten bigger and the fishermen have gotten taller. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I really yeah. feel short here. <laughs> but Jim Leach from Columbus is fishing Lake Michigan off Ottawa County. You got a 30 pound lake trout. That's right. Holy cow. What's the story behind it? Well, not much of a story. Caught it in 80 feet of water off uh, Captain Ron's boat there. Uh, my fish bear here helped net him. It's about the size of it. Well, about the size, but size of it's about 38 inches and 30 pounds. Well, that's just the right size. <laughs> just the right size. <laughs> that's the size we need to eat. Yeah, did you eat this one? Not this one, but the other four we caught that but, morning. But that's the size got. you need to But that's eat. kind we need to eat. You I bet. see. Well, that's terrific. 10 o'clock in the morning, fishing for salmon, I bet. No, we was, look, we was no, looking for lake trout. For this right here. We were looking for lake <laughs> trout, 80 foot of water right on the bottom. Hey, well, that's, that's terrific. What it was and we offered to help him when he, when he thought it was getting a little uh, tired in the arms. So uh, we got our knife out and said, we cut your line any time you want. Did yeah. they do that? Real joker. Huh? We offered to. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you got it in by We yourself? got it. It was, it was a good 20-minute workout, but, yeah, we got it in. Terrific. Well, that's a 30-pound lake trout. You should be proud of that. You bet. Congratulations. Way to go. <laughs> If you'd like to become more involved with a practical sportsman, how about sending us a home video on a hunting, fishing, or wildlife subject? We're looking for good ones to put on the show. If you have an outdoor invention or plans for a practical product you've designed, we'll publish it in our December Digest of Inventions, and Matt Radzilowski will build a number of these on the program. Or if you have an outdoor question, Charlie Keenan is our answer man. We're gathering your questions of law to publish in September. You'll need an application for our hunting and fishing awards if you want to qualify for our trophy book. Our first edition is full of charts, graphs, and maps of where, when, and how the big ones were taken. You want to go fishing this weekend? Matt Radzilowski called to run for the guides report. Oh, everybody's catching fish. Let's see, where should we start? Let's start up in the Upper Peninsula. Dick's favorite sport's up here at Houghton. We got a brook trout limits, a walleye and pike are a little slow. On Tanagan, west end of the UP, uh, brook trout and pike limits. They're getting some lake trout, browns, a walleye in Little Bay to Knock there, and pike. It's not red hot, but it's good. We're catching some lake trout up here in Marquette. Over the east end of the UP, Manuskong Bay, walleye are hitting, get enough for dinner. Uh, good pike fishing, birch tree over here at Drummond Island, smallmouth, two to three per angler. And per look at the perch, 14 inches, whoa. Bucks bait and tackle, Alpena. Walleye good at night. Uh, let's look at inland here, Ross Common. We're talking Houghton Lake, three to five walleye and smallmouth bat li bass limits in the Cut River, Pilgrim's Village Lake, Cadillac and Mitchell. They're, they're doing some good fishing there according to Steve at Pilgrim's Village. Wellman's over here in Oscoda. Smallmouth bass fishing seems to be good around the Great Lakes. Salmon best in 10 years right here off Lake Huron. Uh, Frank's Great Outdoors reports a couple walleye per angler and perch limits here in Saginaw Bay. That's good news. Lakeside Fishing Shop down here, Lake St. Clair. Look at this rundown. Musky good, walleye one to three. We have a bass opener uh, here Saturday, the 17th, and of course Canadian Waters on the 24th. Mill Creek Sports and Dexter. Good bluegill fishing. Now's a good time to get out pan fishing. Trenton Lighthouse, Detroit River, silver bass, smallmouth bass, walleye. Now, over here on the 
Uh, west side cat, the nickels, of course, they can't catch perch right now. That's closed in, in most of the southern part of Lake Michigan, uh, but they're doing good on lake trout. Kings are fair up at Saugatuck. By the way, just got the word that the steelhead are hitting out in the deeper water as well. Lakeland Outfitters are catching limits of smallmouth. Paramarquette up in Ludington uh, got kings, good 8 to 10 pound average. Those are, those are good on the grill. Walleye good in Hamlin Lake. And Captain Emil Dean, salmon and lake trout, good fishing. Look at that, 8 to 10 per boat combined. That's almost like the good old days. I'll tell you what, if you can't find a place to fish that suits you, I guess just wait till the winter. You can go ice fishing, but you really should get outdoors. It's a great place to be. See you next week. Fred Trost Practical Sportsman is brought to you by Enviro Industries of Paradise, Michigan, makers of wood fire barbecue briquettes made from 100% natural hardwoods that burn completely. Wood fire briquettes give food the flavor of an old fashioned wood fire barbecue. By D.L. Kessler & Sons Construction, specializing in residential development and commercial construction since 1977. And by the financial support of viewers like you along the edge of the drop-off. The key to catching these fish is getting your lure down exactly 40 feet where those fish are. That's what the downriggers are for. John Ford is using a lightweight spinning rod. He clips the eight pound test line to the downrigger release. The three pound weight is lowered down 40 feet. When the fish hits, it pulls the line off the clip and John can fight the fish free of the weight that took the lure down. Now, this was our first day of fishing, and success came rather easy. Another fish about the same size. Real funky, though. This one's got a lot more fight than the other one does. 